It all started with the Big Bang. It all started in disorder and chaos. About 13.75 billion years ago, the universe, as the song said, was hot and dense. It expanded rapidly. That's the bang in the Big Bang. This expansion caused it to cool. It cooled enough so that energy was converted into subatomic particles. These particles glommed together, creating enough stardust that glommed together to create clumps that became planets. Our planet, the Earth, or the third rock from the sun, to name another former TV sitcom, had just the right gases which caused just the right atmosphere for life to take hold for the first time that we know of. And today, here we are. Out of a huge explosion came everything we know. Wow even cold, hard science presents us with mystery and awe. The ancients, of course, didn't have a science that postulated anything like the Big Bang Theory, but they did imagine and wonder about how everything there is came to be. And so out of various cultures and religions emerged various notions of this, of these creation stories. One such creation story is fairly familiar to us out of the Jewish and Christian traditions in our Bible, the story of Genesis, the familiar opening words. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. A formless void. In some English Bible translations, the word void is interpreted as chaos. The English word chaos comes from the Greek word chaos for formless matter. Chaos was also the Greek god of chaos. So chaos was the original state of things. But that first chapter of Genesis goes on to show how God brings order to the disorder that began the world. So in both science and theology, we see that disorder is what starts everything off. And here's something interesting. The Big Bang isn't just history. It's still happening, like right now. The universe continues to expand, albeit scientists think at a slower rate than it originally did. Expanding, maybe the scientists postulate infinitely as the original dense matter pre-bang, pre-Big Bang, was, they say, infinitely dense. So maybe, maybe, there's no end to the expansion, no end to the Big Bang, no end to the creative disorder it brings. No end to creation and expansion. We are still experiencing the Big Bang we are still experiencing creation. It started with uncertainty. It continues to start with uncertainty. Every day, in this service here today, every moment we live. Our human response to this uncertainty is to bring order to disorder. That's a good thing. Our lives are made much better because of the inventions and creations we've brought into being. Order. Familiarity, comfort are good things. Every life needs order. But sometimes we become so enamored of our ability to bring order that we overly manage and overly control, that we hold on to that which no longer serves us well. We stay in the comfortable ruts in the road because, well, because we've never done it that way. Such thinking fossilizes our experiences, blocks possibilities trying to emerge. It can be overmanaging, overcontrolling our lives that need, well, a little bit more breathing room so that we can expand and create as the universe wants us to do. In fact, our science is getting ahead of how most of us actually live our lives. Let's go back in history, not all the way to the Big Bang, 
but back to the late 17th and early 18th century, to Sir Isaac Newton, a British physicist and, fun fact, a British Unitarian. Newton, of course, is the father of Newtonian physics or, or classical mechanics. He worked with forces acting on matter with laws of motion and gravitation. He noticed, for example, that things fell down with gravity, a pretty basic concept. He then devised theories of how those things worked in science. In fact, things is a central component of Newton's ideas. His theories were mechanical. How do things work and against other things in the universe? He thought there were two basic building blocks in all the universe, matter and energy. Then very early in the 20th century, a young clerk in a Swiss patent office came up with an idea he called the theory of relativity. That, of course, was Albert Einstein, whose work took physics into a new era and led us to our modern ideas of quantum mechanics, which describes nature down to the very small scales of things we can't see, atomic and subatomic particles. Newton had said the universe was made up of matter and energy. Quantum theory says basically everything is energy, vibrating at various speeds, with those objects vibrating at lower speeds, appearing to us as solid. Newtonian physics saw the universe more as determined, mechanical, machine-like. Quantum physics sees the universe expanding and constantly emerging with various levels of energy at play. Newtonian physics weren't wrong and are still the standard for understanding physics from a macro view, from a very basic view, but quantum thought opened up a new world of micro reality that we did not previously know existed. Newtonian physics looked at the universe as a machine, Quantum physics looks at reality as relativistic, fluid, oriented in relationship. How one quantum piece reacts or is in relationship to another quantum piece. They're predictable only to a degree. We're still trying to find out how some things actually happen, happen in this subatomic realm. So this is to say that as we discover more and more about how the universe works, we are discovering that it is not as orderly as we thought, or at least its order seems to be in a deeper level that we can't quite firmly get our minds around. It's less deterministic, more evolutionary. It's less static, more fluid, and at times, always surprising. Trouble is, too often we're stuck in mechanistic thought and forget the quantum nature of reality. We prefer our own theories, which we can understand more than the complexities of, well, reality itself. Margaret Wheatley is a writer and management consultant. She says, we believe order is available only through the control we exert, that we play God with the world, assuming that nothing happens unless we make it happen. We act like God at times, like in the first account in Genesis, let there be, and it was, and it was good, except so often it's not really that good, some of the stuff that we bring into emergence, or it's not working as well as we had planned. I mentioned before the first of the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and so many other 12-step movement groups. The first step, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol that our lives had become unmanageable. So in AA, the first step in gaining power over a condition in your life, over an illness in your life, is to admit that you were powerless over it. That sounds nonsensical. It doesn't make sense on the surface of things. And yet through this step and the 11 that follow it, millions have found sobriety and help with so many other life conditions. Though the origins of AA are in the Western spiritual tradition, this first step, I've often thought, has a fair amount of Eastern Buddhist wisdom to it. 
To say powerlessness leads to power sounds like a koan that is not rational and yet contains great wisdom. Now, giving up control is not giving up all control, but admitting that we don't have complete control. That sounds self-evident, but if you look at so many of our leadership practices in the world, and if you look at our own human behavior, how we tend to approach our lives and our relationships and our responsibilities, we can so easily get stuck, as Sinatra sang so beautifully long ago, doing it my way and not so much our way. So much of leadership, I think, so much of what passes for leadership is really management, not leadership. Now, there's a place for management and management tools for sure, but mere management doesn't inspire others to greatness. And to be a bit provocative, maybe the sacred works more like the Big Bang and less like the God of Genesis. Can you imagine a little speck no bigger than a bit of dust under your bed, being so dense and thriving with unexpressed energy, thriving with unexpressed energy, that it, that it explodes into everything that is. That sounds preposterous, but that's how the world started in the Big Bang. That hot, dense spot that became the universe was composed of subatomic particles neutrons, proton, protons, who know what tons, that continue to emerge to, in interesting new patterns to find expression. Buddhist teacher and nun, Pema Chodron, counsels we shouldn't be afraid of paradox or uncertainty. She says, it takes a lot of bravery to consider that uncertainty is not a threat, that in fact it's creative and powerful. Uncertainty, unpredictability, creative and powerful. Creation continues. What kind of a world do you want to co-create? One of increasing love, advancing service, richer inclusivity, more enduring justice? What kind of a world do you want to co-create? A culture built on a model of deterministic outcomes or with quantum hope and deepening growth of spirit, soul, and love? Do you approach new situations with beginner's mind? How will you co-create the church you want? Are you hearing the call of possibility. In the Big Bang, there were all the elements in basic form that would eventually, over eons, manifest as the human being created in the words of Genesis, in the image and likeness of God, in the image and likeness of the sacred, the divine imprimatur, the inherent worth and dignity of every person, so the universe was pregnant with us when it first emerged, and it is still pregnant with our future generations. We bring our powers together to act upon one another in the greater realm of the forces of the universe to bless ourselves, to bless each other, and to bless the world. Here in the church, that means empowering, embodying our ministries of love, of inclusion, of transformation, of justice, so that we might be transformed to a world expanding and reaching toward a new emerging reality. And so it is. Amen.